everyone. I'm Maggie Williams, director of the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School, and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum. There is not a month that goes by that our IOP Forum director, Carrie Devine, has not been cornered by students, implored by staff, or beseeched by faculty to bring ta Coates to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. <laughs> yeah, I know. We want to thank tonight's moderator, Dr. Bruce Western, for all he did to make this evening possible. Dr. Western is the director of the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy. The center's research portfolio spans critical social policy topics, including joblessness, criminal justice, education, immigration, labor, and health policy. He is the faculty chair of the program in criminal justice and management, as well as the Daniel and Florence Guggenheim Professor of Criminal Justice Policy here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Dr. Western is also considered the leading expert on the effects of mass incarceration on the poor and is the author of Punishment and Inequality in America, considered a classic in the field. We welcome Dr. Western to the forum as moderator of tonight's conversation. The Institute of Politics is proud to recognize our co-sponsors for this evening. The Ash Center for De Democratic Governance and in Innovation, the Harvard Black Men's Forum, the HKS Black Student Union, and the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, the HKS Office for Student Diversity and Inclusion, and the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. ta Coates is already a historical figure. His intellectual courage, <laughs> yes, his, his intellectual courage inspires us and it makes us all brave. Who else but Coates dare make a compelling argument for reparations just last year? Who else but Coates dare think the unthinkable and spill it out in language so powerful that we come to think of his words as dynamite? Albert Camus said that always go too far because that is where the truth is. We are grateful that Mr. Coates has been willing to go too far. He has been willing to go too far as a national correspondent for The Atlantic and as a journalist writing for The Village Voice, The New York Times Magazine, The Washington Monthly, and The Washington City Paper. Mr. Coates is a MacArthur Genius, Kirkus and Hillman Prize winner, National Book Award nominee, and has won the George Polk and National Magazine Awards. He is the author of two books, Beautiful Struggle, about his father, and Between the World and Me, a letter to his son. Please welcome Bruce Western and ta Coates. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, th this is quite a turnout. Uh, I think we have a, a full house tonight, which is uh, a remarkable thing. And I know in the lottery uh, for the distribution of tickets, uh, I think one in five uh, were able to uh, be with us uh, this evening, but we're live streaming. And uh, I know the audience is very much larger than that. Um, so welcome, uh, everyone, to this conversation with uh, Tanahasi Coates. Um, this event was organised by the Malcolm Weiner Centre for Social Policy with the John F. Kennedy Forum. Uh, I'm very grateful to Barbara Whalen and April Austin at the Malcolm Weiner Centre for all their efforts in putting this event uh, together. Uh, so we're going to begin today uh, by speaking with Tanahasi. And, uh, and as Maggie was saying, uh, Tanahasi writes for the, uh, the Atlantic and uh, he's authored a, a, a powerful series of pieces examining how our, uh, our history of racial discrimination and racialized violence is imprinted 
on contemporary African-American disadvantage. Uh, this summer, uh, as we well know, he published a, a really remarkable essay, Between the World and Me, uh, reflecting on African-American uh, life and its place in African-American uh, American society, uh, particularly in the aftermath of the Michael Brown uh, shooting in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, uh, Tanahasi's work has been widely recognised most recently by uh, a MacArthur Fellowship. And uh, for me, I think, uh, he's the most exciting social and political commentator uh, in America today. Uh, it's a, a thrill to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Tanahasi and I will talk about his work for about 35 minutes, and, uh, and then I'll bring up our panellists, uh, Professor William Julius Wilson and Professor Kathy Eden. Uh, Bill Wilson is the Lewis P. and Linda L. Geiser University Professor at Harvard, uh, and uh, a faculty affiliate of the Wiener Centre. Uh, all I'll say about Bill, and I could introduce him at length, is that for four decades, uh, he's been the towering figure in research on poverty uh, in uh, America. Uh, Kathy Eden is the inaugural Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Sociology, University Distinguished Professor of Sociology at Johns Hopkins, uh, and a dear former colleague of ours, uh, at the Kennedy School and at the Wiener Centre. And through uh, her many books and articles, Kathy has probably taught us more than anyone about the dynamics of family life in poor communities. But before we bring up uh, Bill and Kathy, uh, Tanahasi, uh, welcome to Harvard. Thank you. And uh, let's talk a little bit about your work. Uh, so, in the short period since the summer, uh, I've thought you've made two really significant contributions to our understanding of the contemporary positions uh, of African Americans in American society. Mass incarceration and the criminal justice system have been important uh, to this assessment. So what, what do you mean by mass incarceration? What does this term mean to you? And what's its significance for race and racial progress today? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, my uh, work, you know, my own piece on mass incarceration, uh, to some extent, even the book Between the World and Me, is, um, well, here's a phrase I never thought I would say, is indebted to Harvard. Um, <laughs> I thought I'd say that. <laughs> but it's true. Um, last uh, winter, uh, Bruce, you know, we, we had corresponded over, over email, and Bruce was nice enough. Uh, to assemble you know, himself, Matthew Desmond, Diva Page, who's here, Robert Sampson, uh, for a very, very powerful uh, dinner. Um, and I came up with my editor, Scott Stossel. And you, you know it's a, a serious, serious dinner when you come in thinking one thing about mass incarceration and the African-American family as I, as I did at the time, and then you leave there thinking something totally different. Well, not totally, but you know, things get uh, a lot more complicated than you thought they were going in. Um, so I just, you know, I, I just want to thank you guys for having me. I guess I also should say, you know, while I'm at it, um, I owe your president uh, a, a great debt, Drew Gilpin Faust, um, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous historian. Uh, I'm sure all of you guys already know that, but it's just important for me to say that um, her work is just, you know, this republic of suffering, her stuff on um, slave mistresses during the Civil War, during the South, is really, really important, you know, to my understanding of race in this country. So after that long preamble. Um, I'm going to try to remember the question. I think I remember that. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I think, you know, um, it is, uh, it's funny to like have to answer that question from you, uh, what mass incarceration <laughs> is, but I'll go ahead and give it a shot. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, just on a numbers basis, and I, I know you guys are, are, are already know this, uh, we are, you know, at a level of incarceration in our country that is both um, historically different and geographically different in terms of the rest of the world. So we incarcerate roughly 700 uh, per 100,000 people. Um, in 1970, our incarceration rate was about 160 uh, per 100,000 people, just to give you, you know, some sense of the, the expanse of that. Uh, our next nearest co uh, competitor is Russia, uh, which is at about 450 per 100,000. It's not even uh, close. Um, China has roughly four times the population of the United States. The United States has a half million more people in jail. Um, the United States comprises 5% of the world's population, 25% of its incarcerated population. And then when you start looking at the numbers around race, if you start looking and 
a lot of this is pulled from Bruce, so it's funny to be sitting here with him, but um, I'm quoting his stuff back to him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you start it's looking at, too, yeah, right? no, right? <laughs> as long as it's footnoted, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and then you know it has a particular you know interest uh, the criminal justice system in this country and you know mass incarceration specifically incarceration specifically it has a, a particular interest in African Americans. The incarceration rate for African American males is somewhere around four thousand uh, per hundred thousand. Um, I talked about you know, uh, coming uh, to Harvard and, and thinking one thing and, you know, um, coming out thinking something different. And one of the things I thought before I got here <clears throat> was I think I was pretty much within the camp that, you know, as much as the numbers seem sort of recent, there actually are some things about the numbers that, that are quite old. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, that I realized in this then is this habit of incarcerating black people, of using the criminal justice system to deal with you know, ills in, in other communities that we would use other tools for is actually not exactly new. Um, you know, I was talking to a group of students earlier today and I was pointing out, um, and Bruce, you're going to have to help me with my citation because the citation is really important. But there's a gentleman who wrote the paper, I cited him in, in the article, but I'm just blanking. But he wrote a paper and he basically pointed out that if you went to the northern cities, um, 1920, 1930, 1940, you would find the incarceration uh, ratio between black and white folks to be about somewhere around seven to one. And you would find a lower ratio in the South, but that's because the South was effectively a police state. You don't need incarceration there, right? Well, seven to one is about what our ratio is right now. And what that says to you, that even though we have like a, a number, you know, in terms of just, you know, the, the raw number is larger, the habit of really using incarceration, using the criminal justice system uh, to deal with social problems is not particularly new. And whose paper? That Chris Mello. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is like when you write this stuff, you like have to like digest it, and it just you know, you kind of sometimes you you know even as you cite the names in your work, you you lose the names when it's time to talk. So sorry about that, Chris. Who's here actually? Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. Man. Hi. <laughs> it's a great paper, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and and so uh, so you got this enormous racial disparity, um, and you got these really high rates of incarceration. Now, what what's the significance of that for how we should understand American racism? Yeah, so like so I, what I got you know after that I had like a numbers thing, and after reading that paper I had a numbers thing. There's a great deal of history in that paper about you know Irish immigrants and you know how they related to to black folks coming up north, but. If the numbers can historicize it, you know, my job, you know, putting the, the, the reporting portion of it aside, was to you know, historicize it within the American narrative. And one of the, you know, the arguments I, I make in the piece um, is that the, 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 um, is you can't just find this sort of criminalization in the numbers. It's actually within the documents and within the history itself. And this is you know, more on, on the imaginative end, but I, I really, the politically imaginative end, but I really, really believe it's true. I believe, for instance, that it's significant that we have a fugitive slave clause in our Constitution, that black criminality is literally written into our earliest, earliest documents, that throughout the 250 years that we had slavery in this country, basically for pursuing any you know, other normal, you know, right that folks would pursue for black people, you know, who were enslaved to pursue it. It was effectively a criminal act. Um, I, I believe in heritage. You know, I believe that, you know, as much as George Washington matters, as much as the American Revolution matters, the heritage of telling ourselves certain things about black people also matters too. So, if you have a long history of saying to yourself that black people are in fact criminals, if you follow that history up after black folks are emancipated, with 100 years of what you know, can only really be described as a, as, as a terrorist campaign. And you justify that campaign, you justify lynching, you justify extrajudicial justice through the notion of criminality. If you have somebody like Ben Pitchfork Tillman on the Senate floor, on the Senate floor, making an argument for lynching uh, through the usage of criminality, if you have sociology, you know, folks trying to explain a black uh, a situation and using criminality. If you have, you know, a leadership class, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, that the society effectively regards as criminals. As criminals, very, very important to understand that. You know, I always say, you know, people like to support Martin Luther King now. 
I understand that. I'm all for that. I'm glad our president cited him. I'm not arguing against that. But it's very, very important to understand how Martin Luther King was seen in his time. And in his time, he was treated by the highest powers in this country like a criminal. And, and I think that heritage has some sort of effect. And so when you come into the 1970s and you have, you know, Increasing crime, as we had increasing crime in other, other countries, as we had increasing crime in Canada, as we had increasing crime in Europe, and you ask yourself, why did America choose a particular solution that other countries then didn't? I think that heritage is really, really important. Yeah. I, 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 for me, that is one of the uh, entirely powerful arguments of the, uh, the Atlantic peace uh, that now we're, we're living in a period in which the link between incarceration and crime has become entirely naturalised. Right. And, uh, uh, and you're able to show, no, this is a historical product of uh, uh, centuries of racial domination. Yeah. Um, and, and Bruce, just really quickly, I, yeah. I would push that, um, I would actually push this a little bit further, and I, I would say that is also um, common when African Americans make demands for political rights to point to criminality as, as a response. I was, you know, I was going through uh, Taylor Branch's first book. I mean, this is in like the Montgomery boycott. Like the first thing they say is, oh, clearly these black folks aren't actually protesting. It's Negro thugs or toughs who are making them do it. The, the criminal argument is always there. We were having this discussion upstairs about you know, the need to talk about neighborhood violence. I, I, I believe that, I'm, you know, we can get into that. I'm, I'm, you know, I very much believe it that you know, we as thinkers and actually do need to talk about that. But I think it's also uh, important to point out that in this time, you know, when folks are very, very concerned about police violence, that the answer is yes, yes, but what about crime over there? What about crime in the neighborhood? And I think it's very, very important to point out that that is not a new response, that that is actually a very, very old, old you know, response. What, what's the effect of it, do you think, subjectively, right, to, uh, to live in, uh, uh, live in a world uh, in which you're suspect, in, uh, mm. in which you, your criminality is uh, sort of officially recognised in, in public policy. Um, what's, what's the consequence of that, do you reckon? Um, well, I'm just thinking about myself, and I'm thinking about something that I caught myself doing the other day, and I realised that I do all the time. Um, I was exiting somewhere. And there was a white woman ahead of me, and we were basically headed in the same direction. And I waited to let her get far, far ahead of me. So then she didn't think like I was like following her or anything. And I thought, damn, I do that all the time. Like that's something I actually do. She yeah. didn't look at me any kind of way, or you know, I didn't, there was nothing that she did that would make me think. But I made the assumption myself that she would think that. Who knows what she was actually thinking? You know, um, I, I say that to say that I, I think it's a kind of wait. I think it's a serious, serious way. And I think, you know, you know, one of the things I, I tried to get at in the book is like when, when you're black, you're always like switching the language that you're talking. So I'm on the block and I have to address people one kind of way in order to protect myself, you know, and then I'm not on the block and I have to address, you know, uh, uh, modulate myself in a different way, you know, um, so that people understand that I'm intelligent, that I'm a citizen, that I'm a decent person. Yeah. You know, uh, police officers approach, and I have to mo modulate myself in a different way that other citizens in this society do not. I can remember when I was working as a young reporter at DC, and a guy once told me about how he had, he was another reporter about how uh, the cops had pulled him over, and he had cursed out the cop. And I said, you did what? <laughs> so you did what? <laughs> but people do this. I mean, in other worlds, you know what I mean? There are other worlds where people <laughs> address police departments in, in, in different kind of ways, you know? Um, so there's this constant, I think, you know, I mean, so I'm saying that the, the whole criminality piece is just one thing. It's just another thing, yeah. you know, that you have to deal with as you, you know, you know, modulate yourself. And I obviously worry about that a great deal with my son, you know. Do you want to, you, you got to say something oh, more, more about oh, that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one of the arguments that I, I make in Between the World and Me is that much of what people look at in black America and construe as anger is in fact deep, deep fear. Um, that much of what you know, I saw in black America as, as a young person and construed as anger and uh, as hardness, as toughness was in fact deep, deep fear. Um, 
that goes for my parents, who were tough. Um, that goes for the boys that I walked to school with. That goes for the girls. That goes for everybody. You know, I knew, and this was a, a massive, massive realization for me. You know, I, I didn't understand that at the time. I myself knew that I was afraid, but I thought everybody else knew something that I didn't know and didn't realize that they actually didn't. You know, they, in fact, themselves were afraid. And it's one thing like, to realize that for yourself, but see, then, then you have a child. A child comes into the world. And that's all you have, right? Like that, that really, I mean, you know, who knows that, you know, one day you'll be here, you know, in, in such illustrious company. I had a child when I was 24 years old, right? And all I knew was that if I could do a good job at this, I might actually be a decent person. All parents are afraid. All parents, you know, black, white, whatever, you know, you're, you're, you're all afraid. But black parents are really, really afraid in a different and a particular way. And I think a lot of that has to do with the kind of modulation you know, you, you have to do throughout your life to hopefully do something to protect your body, you know? Um, so that, <laughs> that's been huge for me over the yeah. years. It really, yeah. it has been, you know, we have had numerous conversations over and over and over and over again for, from, you know, as long as the boy could talk, yeah. you know? The, the um, there's a thread uh, that runs through uh, uh, between the world and me, the, uh, uh, so much of your writing about the the insecurity of black bodies. Uh, another thread that runs uh, through your work uh, is just the salience of poverty in so much of African American right. life. And I've sort of been thinking a lot about this, these two themes in your work: uh, violence and poverty. Right. And um, what what connection uh, do you see? Uh, between those things in African American life? Well, I'll be interested in what our co panelists have to say because I think um, my observation is, is an on the ground one. Um, I, I individually did not grow up particularly poor. Um, and I, I definitely did not grow up in a, in a, I guess on paper it would have looked down like a broke down family, but it didn't. My dad has seven kids by four different women, and that looks a kind of way to sociologists. Um, but but my, my perception was not that. I mean, I was in contact with all of my brothers and sisters. My dad was very much a father. Everybody you know, knew who, you know, who was whose mother. And who was who. It looked very organized to me, in fact. It did not look, you know, I just thought, you know. And in fact, what I compared it to was everybody else I knew in the neighborhood, the vast majority of them who did not have a father. So I actually thought, you know, we were stable. That was my, you know, understanding of it. Um, but I was born in a neighborhood, right? And I was, you know, born in a neighborhood where people did not have certain things. I was born, you know, in a neighborhood, you know, that had been shaped by the housing policies of, of, of Baltimore City. Baltimore City is a city that at one time actually had, they tried to actually have racial zoning until the Supreme Court uh, struck it down. My mother grew up in the, uh, the very, very same uh, projects where Freddie Gray died. Um, my grandmother, and I didn't learn this until I published the case for reparations, had herself taken out a contract loan to buy her, you know, her home. Um, did not actually own the home outright until many, many years later, um, well into my lifetime. So this, this was a community that was shaped by those forces. My, my middle school, particularly, was really, really violent. That's, that's what I remember it most. That's what I remember having to go through, like, the rituals. And I, I don't think, like, you can separate, like, like, the amount of violence from, you know, to, to use Rob's terminology, from the deprivation. I, I, I just don't, which, you know, compounded across generations and was concentrated into one area because I was very aware that if I went over to Mount Washington, if I went over to Roland Park, if I cut on the TV and saw how the rest of the country lived, see, they, they didn't live that way. You know, I didn't have the history at the time. You know, what I, you know looking back on it now, what I, under, what I would have understood is that those neighborhoods had not suffered, those people had not suffered in that same sort of way. And so I, I can remember, like, being young and so much of the violence being about proving to other people that, as we used to say, that you were hard, which is to say that you would not be made a target, that you yourself could not have violence put upon you, which, you know, I have to say, you know, we have this sort of conversation about, you know, a culture of poverty, a culture of violence. You can call that a culture. I have no problem uh, with that. But within the context, it made a lot of sense to me, you know, and it makes a lot of sense to me now. Um, so I think like you, you, you can't really separate that kind of pose, which I certainly participated in. Um, 
And this like goes back to, again, I mean, talking to your kid, right? Like your kid has to be one way or feels like he has to be one way on the street, but yet, you know, you know, and I was very, you know, very, very determined about this, that your kid has to, you know, go see other things. And that kind of way that he's going to be in one environment does not work in another environment. Is it, so, is, so is incarceration and uh, uh, rough handling by police mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, intrusive uh, forms of policing, is that violence in the same way or...? Um, I think ultimately, yeah. I think ultimately, yeah. I think it comes, I think that the, the method of distribution is, is different, you know what I mean? But I think ultimately, I mean, I, I when I think about, like, again, the, the, the violence in the community that I grew up in, it's very, very hard for me to separate that from policy. And when I think about why Freddie Gray was killed, it's very, very hard for me to separate that from policy. Um, to, like, just to take the police example, you know, having already talked about the housing and, you know, education in the schools in, in Baltimore. Um, Freddie Gray, I mean, this is the case as it, as it was reported. Freddie Gray makes eye contact with a, with a police officer. He looks suspicious to the police officer, and he runs. And this is an arrestable offense, right, in Gilmore Homes. But it's not an arrestable offense on the Upper East Side to look at somebody a certain way and run. And it's not an arrestable offense because we've determined that that's an area of high drug traffic. And we've decided that certain things will be arrestable that will not be arrestable in other areas. Is that smart? I mean, what, what are we actually pursuing there? I, I, I'm not clear. You know, and so I think, as Americans, we make certain decisions about policy that don't seem obviously violent. That don't, in the, in the immediate term, it's not us saying, listen, we're going to go in and you know, do X, Y, and Z to these folks. We're going to go kick in doors. But in fact, ultimately have to have violence as the, as the, as the outcome. Yeah. You know, um, I, I think about um, that, that young lady in the school. Uh, just a few weeks ago, it was flipped over and dragged, you know, uh, across the floor, right? Well, is the officer there because they said they, you know, are going to deal with children in that school, you know, through violence? Probably not. I mean, they're probably there, you know, to prevent violence, if anything. In fact, I think some of the students, a buddy of mine was telling me some of the students actually organized a protest in their support. And they said because when fights break out, this is the guy, you know, break, breaks the stuff up. But maybe there's a series of questions that came way before you even got to the officer that should be asked. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe by the time you get the officer in the classroom, maybe by the time you even get the officer in the school, like you're, you're way too late, you're far gone. You know? um, and, and we accept it. And so we begin our debates with, should the officer have done X, Y, and Z, as opposed to why he was in school in the first place. You know, we begin our debates, the same thing in the neighborhood. You know, why are these kids acting a certain way? But maybe five things happened before we even got there. You know, right. and, and I think if there's anything I'm trying to do in my work is get us to think, of, think in that sort of way. Yeah, so, so let me sort of go there. And uh, so I, th I think often uh, what you're pushing on is uh, a, a different concept of justice. Ultimately, you've given us a, a, a social analysis in which uh, contemporary inequalities and disadvantage uh, uh, historically produced uh, in which uh, public policy, political forces are front and centre and uh, the patterns of inequality uh, that we see are very much the product of political choices. Um, and this compels us, I think, this is what I read in your work, to think about justice in a different way. Uh, it puts things like reparations uh, on the table. Um, as we think about the massive problem of mass incarceration, what does justice look like in the face of mass incarceration? Um, wow. Well, let's, let's go back to, 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 to like your, your, your question about justice. Um, one of my great frustrations in, early in my career, before I became a writer, was that it, it just felt like when we were talking about problems, the, the conversation was attenuated. We, we had a point that we began and then there was a point that, that we ended. You know, so if it was urban policy, it, you know, we basically, Watts was the beginning of history. And everything that had happened before then felt like cut off. And um, I'm, I hope to, and it's not just me, you know, obviously you know, a number of historians and sociologists are doing this work, but just open it up you know, a little bit more um, so that we can see history in, 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 as a longer process. Reparations for me fits into that um, because 
if you just study you know, black folks and you ask yourself, well, what happened since the 60s, if you see that as a, as a massive breaking point, then the claim becomes harder. You know? um, and you get into all these other discussions that I, I think we've been you know, uh, uh, caught up in. But if you open the window, if you, if you can see like, the country as an entity in, in and of itself, it does not die with each individual generation. And you know, we know that to be true in any other area of our policy. If that were not true, we wouldn't be able to collect taxes. We wouldn't be able to enforce treaties. We wouldn't be able to do anything. We wouldn't be a state if the country were not an entity. <clears throat> and you ask yourself, well, what, what is that entity's policy been towards black people since they arrived on these shores? And um, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. I mean, even if you say, well, last 50 years, we, we tried to kind of do the right thing. Well, I mean, you got a lot of history before that you know, to do. And one of the cases I make you know, in, my, in my own journalism that you know, uh, the, the preeminent way to understand it, as far as I'm concerned, is plunder. That, that has been the relationship between African Americans and their country. That that is what enslavement ultimately is. It is taking things from people. That lynching was not simply done just to be mean to people, but to enforce certain you know, norms that enriched, you know, other people. That when you deprive people of the right to vote, when you deprive people of the right to have a say in their governance, and you still tax them, and you still tell them that they have to, you know, hold up their end of the social co uh, contract, that you are taking from them. That that too is plunder. That if you tax people and you, you know, build segregated schools that they can't attend, and you, you know, build segregated pools that they can't swim in, and segregated public university systems, that they can't attend, that you are in fact taking from them. That that's what the policy is, that you, if you have a housing policy in this country, as we did have, that basically rests on the idea of cutting a group out. That you have social programs in this country, as we did have in the mid 20th century, that can only be passed by cutting a, a group out, that that is plunder. And then if you stop doing that, or you, you say rhetorically that you're gonna stop doing that, let's, let's take the conservative part, say you stop doing that, and you follow that up with this policy of, of, of incarceration, which you know, looks innocent, which looks like you know, simply a response to crime. But if you can understand it as something that you were prone to do, because of everything you did before that. You know, I think it, it puts a certain weight on us. And I don't know that the weight ends simply by saying, let's decarcerate. I, I don't know that it's enough to look at the past 40 years of policy, look at the population of people who've been bearing the brunt of that policy, and say, you know what, we made a mistake. We're sorry, no harm, no foul. Or big harm, but no foul. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know that that... I, decarceration, which would be really, really hard in and of itself, you know, if you talk about you know, returning to you know, 1970 levels, you know, even controlling, you know, accounting for population growth, I think that's going to be really, really hard in and of itself. But w w what's the program? I mean, do you just mm -hmm. send folks back into... The communities that are already struggling in and of themselves? I mean, what, 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 is, what are we supposed to do about the last 40 years, though? That happened. That happened. You know, um, that doesn't even seem to be on the table. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, and I don't even know that serious decarceration is on the table. But then there's a conversation even after that that, that is not. And so reparations, for me, you know, it supports the idea. It is not enough to just stop wounding someone. That you actually have to heal someone. <laughs> You actually have to do something about the harm that you've produced. It's not enough to simply say, I've stopped harming. You know, we, we wouldn't accept that in any other you know, sort of exchange between you know, uh, groups of people or individuals. I don't know why we accept it as an exchange between our society and African Americans. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's a really challenging idea for a school of public policy, right? Because mm -hmm. for us, uh, you don't What's think the president is going to come out for reparations? <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't believe it's going to happen? Could stunned. happen. I mean, I'm uh, stunned. Uh, <laughs> the, the, but I, I think that, uh, for this room, right, frequently our response to bad mm -hmm. public policy is improving public policy. Right. But of course, that doesn't speak to uh, the challenges of historic injustices. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it doesn't make right the past. And, uh, and I think within our domestic policies, uh, I'm, I'm not sure we have great models for that, right? I think looking internationally the, uh, uh, in the field of human rights, uh, uh, truth and reconciliation processes, official apology, uh, Nuremberg, uh, yeah. 
after World War II. I mean, these were... But those are usually after massive like social upheaval, like something has happened to compel like the society to do something, which yeah. is even more depressing. Yeah, the product of vast political will at right. a time of crisis. Right, right, right. It's not, it's rarely because, I can't, I can't think of a case when it's been like moral improvement, like we just decide we're going to be better. You know? Um, I, don't, I don't know that to exist in history. But we say we're exceptional, so maybe. I mean, that's, that's what we say, right? We say we're exceptional. Uh, I had a question down here about your pessimism. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> the, I'm not pessimistic. <laughs> Uh, you guys are naive. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> not you, Bruce. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I, I want to invite our other panelists okay. uh, up onto the stage now. So, uh, Kathy and Bill, if you could, uh, if you could join us. Am I standing? Uh, so we've uh, we've talked a bit uh, uh, among ourselves about uh, uh, how we should uh, how we should uh, respond uh, uh, to Tanahasi's analysis of uh, uh, contemporary uh, urban poverty, uh, race in America, as it is today. Bill, if I could turn to you first. Um, uh, what's your reaction to the conversation we've been having so far? I think it's a, a very, it's very interesting conversation, and I would like to see if I can put things in a slightly different context, but relate my comments to what you and Tanahasi uh, uh, discussed. Um, you know, when you were talking about your background somewhat middle-class background. I was thinking that, you know, um, sometimes we forget that African Americans are not a monolithic uh, socioeconomic group. And um, I recently read a report by uh, Kendra Bischoff and Sean Reardon, which was prepared for the uh, Russell Sage Foundation, and they pointed out that <coughs> whereas uh, African American uh, families in 1970 um, recorded the least income segregation among racial and ethnic groups uh, in metropolitan areas of at least 500,000 residents. Today, believe it or not, they have the highest uh, income segregation, uh, which is driven in part by the sharp uh, increase in concentrated black poverty and the rapid rise in the black middle class since 2000. Now, please understand that I'm talking about residential segregation among black families of different income levels, not segregation between black families and white families. And another way, you know, sort of talking about um, these uh, trend lines um, is that they describe uh, the extent to which um, exposure of families of neighbors of the same race has changed over time. And I really want to highlight this point. Poor African Americans today have fewer, much fewer, middle class neighbors than they did mm -hmm. in 1970. And when income segregation is coupled with racial segregation, uh, poor blacks cluster in neighborhoods that feature uh, disadvantages uh, over several dimensions, um, joblessness, uh, educational attainment, 
uh, family breakups, and crime. So since we've been talking here about crime, just take uh, the crime as one of these dimensions. We were talking about poverty and crime. Uh, in 1978, uh, poor blacks aged 12 and over were only uh, marginally more likely than affluent blacks to be victims of violent crime. Uh, roughly uh, 45 and 38 per 1,000 individuals, respectively. By 2008, that has changed significantly uh, to uh, poor blacks 75 per 1,000 victims of violent crime, affluent blacks down to 23 per 1,000. And violent crime can reach uh, extraordinary levels in some of the poorest black neighborhoods. Take, for example, Milwaukee, where 46% of African Americans live in high poverty neighborhoods. That is, neighborhoods uh, with poverty rates of at least uh, 40%. So in Milwaukee, a black person is 20 times more likely than a white person to be shot and nine times more likely uh, to be murdered. Now, many of these incidents involve gang fights, but uh, they also reveal, I think if you did a close analysis, it would reveal that a number of, uh, of the victims were innocent. Now, many of these um, poor, uh, inner city neighborhoods, sort of putting things in context, relating back to some of ta Hish's comments. You've got to put this in context. Uh, not only feature uh, increasing and prolonged uh, joblessness, but they're also characterized by a dwindling number of non-poor families and depopulation. You know, I think about HBO's The Wire. David Simon did a brilliant job of capturing depopulation, vacant lots, abandoned buildings, and so on, uh, making it much more difficult to sustain, you know, the basic institutions in these neighborhoods or to achieve what Rob Sampson would call adequate levels of uh, social uh, organization. Now, this results in a weak institutional resource base. You know, Rob, when I wrote When Work Disappears, this is a con, you probably don't remember, but you said, you, you raised this issue about a weak institutional resource base. You, you know, you see, it's easier for parents to control the behavior of their children when a strong institutional resource base exists when the links between uh, uh, community organizations, civic clubs, political organizations, schools, churches, and so on are stable and strong. The higher the density and stability of formal organizations, the less illicit activity, such as drug trafficking, crime, prostitution, and gang formation can take a route uh, in the neighborhood. Now, neighborhoods, however, that feature a weak institutional resource base, parents in these neighborhoods have a much more difficult time of raising their children, much more difficult time of controlling the behavior of adolescents, of uh, preventing them from uh, getting involved in activities that are detrimental uh, to pro-social uh, uh, development. And we should appreciate that 
these parents live under constraints that people in the broader society don't realize or can't even imagine. And I wish there was greater awareness and appreciation, especially among national policymakers, about their plight, their, the ordeals that they experience. And this leads into public policy discussions, which we could talk about later. Fantastic. And, uh, and uh, Kathy, um, where's the family? Uh, Bill spoken to us uh, about uh, neighborhoods, the structure of neighborhoods, the, uh, the, uh, the institutional landscape uh, uh, that characterizes neighborhoods. Uh, where's the family in this story? So uh, one of the ways that this uh, uh, disadvantage is manifest as as uh, the essay in The Atlantic points out, is really in the family. Um, and I'm going to start with the family, but I'm going to end with incarceration. Uh, so bear with me for a moment, because uh, when we think about uh, the black family, we often think of the single parent family. And I'm going to uh, try to convince you in just a few minutes that there are no single parent families. Things are much more complex and actually getting a more realistic idea about what's happening to low-income families more generally, black, white, and Latino, uh, because single parenthood is now not a solely an African-American issue, but its main growth is among whites and Latinos. Um, get, getting that more in-depth, uh, accurate understanding of, of what's going on in the family can help us think a lot better about how we might uh, address uh, the unique uh, needs and, and assets of these families. So, uh, we began with this, uh, this claim, there are no single mothers. So uh, recently, family demography has revealed that uh, when a young woman uh, comes to the hospital who is unmarried and gives birth, uh, if you interview her or her partner at the time of the birth, about 80% of the time it turns out that this couple is in a romantic relationship. About half the time, the couple is actually living together in a family relationship. And in fact, we know that all, virtually all of the growth in single parenthood recently has been due to a rise in cohabiting relationships. But we also know that there are very, very high rates of disillusion, even among these cohabiting couples. Uh, by the time uh, these unmarried children reach the age of five, only about 30 are in stable families. And we also know that particularly in the United States context, um, there's rapid repartnering and subsequent childbearing. Uh, so Americans love to get together, and they love to break up, and they love to get together again. So when you put all of this together and you look at this portrait from a child's point of view, okay, and these are unmarried children, only 4% of children spend the first five years of their lives in a stably single family household. And I think this is really profound because uh, in some ways we've sort of unfairly blamed the single mother, right? Because we've thought about uh, the counterfactual of the two-parent married family as the stably single mother. And we've kind of blamed the differences between children raised in single mother families and two-parent families on the single mother. So if they're not single mothers, then what are they? Uh, so the next thing I want to convince you of is that these are actually complex, unstable families. I've been trying to convince uh, physicians of this. You know, they, they actually think the family is uh, the mother and child. They have maternal and child. Uh, my department in the School of Public Health at Hopkins used to be called the Department of uh, Child and Maternal Health, as if men didn't matter. Uh, but men are everywhere in these families, uh, not just Tanahisi's family. Uh, so when you, a single parent family presents itself, think to yourself, aha, this is probably actually a complex, unstable family. And in fact, the rates of instability and complexity are so great, and the family forms that result, and again, this is not just among African Americans, but they're disproportionately represented, is now uh, so, um, should we say, I, I wish I had a table to show you, as a, you know, kind of a stick figure, a set of images to show you what these families look like, uh, that it becomes hard to imagine how parents and children really navigate all of these complex relationships. 
Uh, and I will say that we know from demographers uh, that these rates in the United States are historically unique. The United States has not been like this before. And uh, we are also unique as uh, among our rich, our rich uh, nations, our, our other counterparts. So uh, we may look a little bit like Latvia, uh, but we don't look like the rest of the, de of the developed world. Now you may say to yourself, so what? And I think that's a very good question to ask. We should always be uh, you know, questioning our assumptions that things are good and bad. So in order to answer that question, we need to ask how families are faring. And here, uh, the literature that's emerging is quite troubling. So it turns out that kids are really resilient. Uh, in, in the face of parental divorce, they often adapt. Um, and uh, what's, what's really consequential is the rate of change. And what we're seeing uh, increasingly is that the rate of change is so rapid that kids are having trouble adjusting and that the rate of transition and the speed of transition ends up being highly consequential for children, particularly boys. Dads, too, are not faring very well. They're ending up having their children across multiple partners uh, more often than not. Uh, David Williams, one of the dads we interviewed in Philadelphia, he had a beautiful relationship with the mother of his youngest child. Uh, he describes the birth of this baby uh, who, who came out of his mother's womb spinning like a bullet, uh, in his words, as one of the beautiful, most beautiful moments of his life. He works selling newspapers at the base of the Ben Franklin Bridge, one of the, one of the, you know, the toughest uh, and most degraded jobs you can have. And yet he brings his money home, uh, gives it to his partner, Deborah, and delights in parenting both his child and his, his partner's two children, who's biological father is incarcerated. So he looks like a fabulous dad, right? But it turns out he has four other children, two by a, uh, by a woman who, uh, when he was incarcerated, simply left town, leaving no forwarding address, and this, this is not uncommon. And two others uh, that he was also separated from quite young, uh, when he was also incarcerated, who he's really uh, not got much of a relationship uh, with at all. So. Uh, many men are very much like uh, David Williams. They end up fathering in a serial selective fashion. And in fact, if you look at the NLSY, the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, what you see is that though 85% of men who ever had a non-marital birth are actively parenting at least one of their children on a weekly or daily basis, 50% have also left another child completely behind of men who've had children uh, by more than one woman. So you have, uh, you have a lot, of, um, uh, you have a lot of, of strain in the family. And, and what, what this does to men, of course, it puts them on a family go round where they, they don't get to parent all of their children well. And it puts children on a father go round where many of them will have no adult that stays with them uh, for the life course and is there long enough to pay the college tuition bill or even to attend the high school graduation. Finally, though, I want to say that all policy is family policy. I did learn a thing or two during my seven years here. Um, and uh, I taught a class called Poverty and Social Policy that, uh, that I loved. And uh, in that class, we talked about the fact uh, that direct interventions into the family have not worked very well, right? But indirect effects uh, interventions show dramatic results. Uh, everything from preschool, high quality preschool interventions, uh, to high school interventions, uh, to wage subsidies for working welfare recipients have shown dramatic uh, increases in the probability that men will be living with their children and their children's mother uh, in stable two-parent homes even 40 years, you know, in the case of Prairie Perry Preschool, the results are 40 years out. And what this signals to us is that if we improve our basic institutions, preschool, high school, uh, offering people a modest living wage, we can do a lot to restore the family. And in fact, in some uh, work that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, in a minute, uh, we also have the power to do the opposite. But it's certainly uh, not that family fragility is inevitable. Uh, but to end on a depressing note, since we are talking about <laughs> mass incarceration, <laughs> I do want to talk about uh, the fact that incarceration is a policy approach uh, that we have 
quite a lot of evidence now that it's done the opposite. Uh, it, 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 there, we have evidence that it's really tearing uh, the fabric of these relationships apart. Note that each of uh, David Williams' parenting attempts were interrupted by a spell of incarceration uh, that led to a disengagement between him and his children. And we see this in quantitative data as well. In fact, in a paper that Bruce published, I don't know if you remember this paper, in 2004 with Sarah McClanahan and Len Lopo, yeah, yeah. Uh, they find that among uh, high school dropouts, the least educated men in their sample, uh, that if they, uh, you know, it's kind of a fancy paper, it has some, some imputations, but if you assume a zero incarceration uh, model, a uh, society, uh, you could cut the marriage gap uh, between African Americans and whites in half. So although incarceration is, uh, is, is there, there's evidence that it's really uh, deleterious to the family, uh, there's also hope uh, that if we continue to work and move on this margin, uh, we can improve things dramatically. So, uh, the, the terrific comments. And I, I, I want to turn to Tanahasi uh, quickly before opening the floor. And I, I, I see a bunch of continuities between uh, Bill's and Kathy's comments uh, uh, with the conversation we started with. Uh, I don't want to load, load the dice, though. Uh, we, we, where do you, have, uh, how do you uh, relate uh, our initial conversation uh, uh, to the neighbourhoods that Bill was talking about, to the families that, uh, that Kathy was describing? You know what, I'm going to pass on that question. <laughs> and I just want to process, because this is, I actually just took in a lot. Yeah. And I don't know that I have an intelligent response yet. <laughs> Um, I, I have like very initial poorly formed. But I haven't seen Bill's research, so I was very you know excited to hear it. I, you know, I can't re re read the paper, um, so I'm just pulling in a lot right now. I don't want to like just okay. come on my face and say something <laughs> stupid. So. I'll we get more cheering next. Yeah. So, so uh, that's an invitation to the floor then, and uh, um, uh, we're going to uh, uh, open up. Uh, open up the discussion to you. Uh, I, I want to ask uh, each of you, when you ask a question, to do three things. Uh, could you please identify yourself? Could you ask one brief uh, question, please? Uh, no speeches. And, uh, and the really characteristic thing of a question is that it ends in a question mark. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would... I would urge you in the strongest terms to uh, pose a question uh, to the panel. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, my name is Trevor Brand Seraph, uh, college class of 2015. And my question is, is uh, I think, pretty quick. It seems like there's a divide between the mass popularity among a lot of the left who very much identify with Black Lives Matter, with Tiny C. Coates' writing, and with this being an issue that matters, there seems to be a divide between uh, their awareness of it as an issue and their openness slash willingness uh, to embrace policy, uh, policy moves that would actually start making a difference that are sometimes hard to do, let alone have the political will to really push them through. And I'm curious what your reactions are um, to that kind of divide and how you guys think about pushing that divide. Well, I don't, I don't know that, there's, um, that that is where the divide. I mean, it's not like if, you know, um, you got to convince the whole country. You know, I think that there, therein is the divide, you know. Um, I think it's very, very hard. I think it's very, very hard. I mean, I, um, and I was just thinking as I was listening to my, to my, you know, uh, two esteemed uh, commenters here, whether, you know, I was, you know, like stressing race too much, you know, because they are always, you know, these other, you know, sort of uh, um, dimensions that you can look at the problem by. And yet, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I can't escape, you know, uh, from the fact that I think that one of the problems here is, is to have, you know, the kind of differing policy that, that, that you would need. Um, I think part of that really, really involves looking at black people in a different way. There was a story just uh, a week or so ago, a week and a half ago, front page in the New York Times, this alarming heroin rise. 
among uh, white people. White people are using heroin at, at alarming rates. Well, I remember the crack era, and, and I remember the response. And my recollection, I was only 10 years old, but my recollection, at least, is that the response was not that. That it was very, very different. Um, and so I, I say this to say that I, I, I don't know that, you know, even as you know, we, we, we talk about, as we focus on you know, these, these sort of you know, very, very important categories, you know, poverty is very, very, very important, obviously. You know, the, the trends that Kathy is talking about here are not just among black people. And yet, sometimes, and I have no, you know, no way of proving this, that, that this way of seeing black folks, you know, in a certain way, that when, you know, the president is, for instance, pushing uh, uh, for health care at the time, the immediate, you know, uh, notion that this is reparations, I would have liked that, but that wouldn't have been it. I mean, that wouldn't have been what I would have called reparations. I have no problem with reparations, but that's not what I would have called it. But the immediate thought that this is some sort of giveaway to, to, to black people, the, the instinct to see a young girl flipped over in a chair, dragged across the floor, I said this like five times a day, but to immediately ask, what did she do? Yeah. Yeah. You know, as opposed to, you know, hey, I wouldn't want that done to my daughter. Like, I, I, I wonder if we can separate that out, you know? Um, so I think it's beyond a lot. I think that, like, you have to get a critical mass of people in this country to see black people differently, you know, uh, to, 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 to put it straight. I don't know how you do that. Good evening, my name is Monica Cost, and um, I finished reading your book, Between the World and Me, about two weeks ago on an airplane, and had I known I was gonna have the response I had, I probably would've waited till I got home. I cried for about 40 minutes. Oh. And I'm still happy that I read it, but I'm raising two little black boys. And so, you know, I take it this is your first time interacting and t talking to your son about these issues, and I'm just wondering, based upon the information that you've given him and how much you talk to him about it, it, do you recommend that, or do you feel like you've said too much, or do you feel like you haven't said enough? I'm just curious on a personal no, level I don't, how that's I, going. No, yeah, I have no recommendation uh, for how people should interact with their kids based on that book, because that's not my, my son's first time seeing that. It's a literary form that I chose. Um, We've been having those conversations for years. Yes, no, I was more saying how you felt about what you've been saying to your child. Oh, do you how know, do have, I feel? Have you, yes. Yeah, I feel like I you know, would rather burden him with the information than to have him go out in the world and get you know, punched in the face by it. I'd rather prepare him. Hello, my name is Chuck. Oh, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> oh, and there too. <laughs> Mr. Coates, my name is Yvonne Baptiste. I'm a second year here at the Kennedy School. Um, one of the things that, I, that struck me the most about reading Between the World and Me was your statement that as I think sort of a coping mechanism, African Americans have almost romanticized um, slavery in a way because we see, them, see ourselves as the redemption, the hope of uh -huh. uh, those who have who suffered through slavery, something that you suggest in your book that your son should not do. Right. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about that and whether or not you wrote that because you think, well, because rightfully so, sacrifice implies a choice. Um, and if that's not the case, then why choose yeah. those particular words? Well, I didn't do that, but that's interesting. That, that is, oh. No, I'm serious, that's, that's a reading. No, it's, 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 it's a perfectly credible and very, very interesting reading. I think it comes out of two places. It comes out of like my, my atheism. And so I think um, if you have a belief in a, in a divine power and some sort of continuance and an afterlife, you know, and the idea that in some sort of way, as you know, we tend to say that folks are looking down on you, then you know, it, it becomes a little easier. In fact, perhaps necessary to think that way. Um, I have a hard time doing that myself, you know? Um, I think that we had 250 years of enslavement in this country, and I think what that meant was that individual black people died, um, and that was all they knew. They were born into slavery, and then, you know, it ended with slavery, and their kids and grandkids for generations, and their parents and grandparents for generations before them um, experienced the same thing as individuals, and I, I don't want to anesthetize that, 
by making it into a mass of people who somehow sacrificed for me. Because as you allude to, they never should have had to sacrifice to begin with. That should never be forgotten. You know, and I think like there's a tendency, you know, especially you know, as we talk about progress that you know, is very real, that's happened in this country, to you know, congratulate ourselves. But see, it was wrong. It was wrong to begin with, you know, from, from jump. It was wrong. And so we're pulling ourselves up out of the wrong. It's good, happy to say that, but it, it still was wrong. You know, um, and I, I think like the, um, these folks didn't ask to be your martyrs. They didn't ask for that. They asked to be free, and they didn't get that. And I, I think like um, I, one should be very, very careful about de deriving pleasure. Well, let me, let me say that more fairly. One should be very careful about deriving one's individual destiny. The notion that somehow, you know, um, one gets to enjoy freedoms because these people suffered. They didn't ask to suffer. I just think that's really, really, really important, important to remember. Hi, Mr. Coates. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, I'm a first year student at the Kennedy School, and I wanted to ask what you think about the protests that are happening at Yale right now. And Missouri. Um, and Missouri. And well, other campuses. And other campuses. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason I specifically mention Yale is because I'm curious what you think about how to challenge institutions that perpetuate race, but whether the protests that are going on right now are closing an honest conversation or opening it up. Well, I highly doubt they're closing it. Because <laughs> I would presume if there was something there, and I wonder if it was there to begin with. Having said that, having said that, I. I swear to God, I'm not trying to duck your question. I have been on book tour for seven weeks now. I'm not even clear what they're protesting over. You, do you know that? Like, I just don't, I just haven't got, I know what the inciting incident was. I know about the Halloween letter, but I suspect that, again, as I was saying to Bruce, that it's about five other things behind that. And I don't know those five other things. Do, do you understand? I'm just not up on, you know, the situation like that well enough to know. So I, I would be hesitant to, to critique them on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Um, my name is China Boke Terrell, and I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Um, I'll just throw a few questions out there. Um, given that you're a Baltimore native, number one, are the right people running for mayor in Baltimore? Um, <laughs> That's for you. You don't answer that question. <laughs> number two, for the Freddie Grays who are out there um, that are already at the age that we are, is there a generation? that we have to give up on? Like, is there anything that can be done to bring them back from, well, what they're about to experience if things don't change, literacy, job, records, that kind of a thing? Third, um, oh now that, <laughs> they're short questions. <laughs> but now that you and your family are in France, I'm really curious to know, what are you discovering about race relations there? Because I think it's, I used to live in Lyon, France, and I think it's amazing that France was such a haven for the literary greats, the Harlem Renaissance folks, all these people. But now, when you go, you see brown people basically security guards at department stores. Um, and they haven't been able to progress much beyond that. So there you go. There are my questions. <laughs> um, you, how about you answer the Baltimore question? Uh, the Baltimore question. Because I haven't lived in Baltimore. As, I, I've never lived there as an adult. That's, that's the thing you should know. I was born in, No, I just, I mean, okay. I, I don't even know who's running, literally. You know, oh, I okay. can't answer. It's a crowded field. Sheila Dixon Whether and Nick, the right uh, Marilyn yet. Mosby's husband, Nick Mosby. Okay, all right. We're going to let a Baltimore resident get at it, though. Okay. Yeah, it's a crowded field. Yeah, so that's all I'll say. <laughs> that's your answer? <laughs> that's your answer? Right, so you had two more questions. Um, I, I am never in favor of giving up on any generation. I just, you know, um, as, as I said before, um, folks didn't ask for this. You know, I mean, you have to fight. Even if you think you're going to lose, you, you have to fight. You know, even if all your analytics say you're going to lose, you, you just got to fight. You, know, you got to look yourself in the, in the mirror you know, at night before you go to bed. And you know, I said this earlier today. It's very, very important to me um, that I look myself in the mirror and not feel like I am amongst those who are trying to push the earth over the ledge. It's important in and of itself, no matter what happens after that. Um, in, in terms of France, I mean, I think people Let's just you know, clear something. Like, I didn't go there fleeing racism in America. I, I, I didn't have high expect. I mean, I had some expectations. I thought I would drink some great wine, eat some good food, and see some art. 
You know what I mean? I mean, seriously, it's just a place. It's just another place. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It, it is not a... Um, and so I went at a, at, a, at a relatively advanced age. I was like 37. So by then, you know, whatever, maybe had I gone at like 21 or 22, I would have felt differently. But at 30, I just, you know, um, I felt like I was a writer. I felt like writers should, you know, speak other languages. And I did not speak another language. I still don't. I'm working on it. But that's what this year is about. Um, I felt like going this year that I had an ignorance of the world. That, you know, again, was very, very much tied to neighborhood, the kind of school I went to, who I was around. Um, I did not want my son to, to be in that same sort of way. You know, I wanted him to have experiences that I had not had. It was very, very important to me. Um, but it, it, it really is just a place. Do you, you know what I mean? And it, it is not immune from the deeply human pattern of erecting societies and states by putting your foot on somebody else's neck. You know, America is my problem because I'm an American. But there's nothing you know, particularly uniquely evil or wrong. I mean, I'll, the way we do it, obviously, is different as it will be in every society. But I think it's very, very important for people to understand that, 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 that there is no escape, you know, that you will go to another society and you'll just find yourself again. You know? Hi. I'm uh, Mario Small. I'm actually uh, in the sociology department here, joining the illustrious colleagues you've talked about a minute ago. Uh, first, I want to thank you for taking the work of uh, all of my colleagues and making it, uh, first of all, not just accessible, but also tying it to a historical and literary form that I think is all too rare even in my own field. So thank you for that. Um, I've read your pieces in The Atlantic. I haven't read your book yet. But I had a question for you about a point you made earlier about modulating your communication. You talked about the fact that you know, you're talking here. You sort of speak, and you modulate your behavior for the context. If you were in the streets of Baltimore, you'd be doing something different, et cetera. It's a point that I think a lot of the people of color here, for example, could resonate to the fact that in different contexts, you have to sort of speak multiple languages and so on. I want to talk to you about that same point in the context of your book. Uh, the book is also a form of communication. Uh, you talked about the fact that you wrote it for your son as a literary form. But in spite of that, there was an audience. You were sort of modulating your communication there for a particular audience. My question for you is sort of, what is that audience? What were you trying to represent to that audience? Why did you think that was important? I don't really modulate in my writing, you know? And I just realized that. That's why I love it. <laughs> That's so funny. No, it's not modulated at all. That's me right there, man. I mean, that is more me than me sitting here talking right now. Okay. That is, I mean, no, it is so, I was telling somebody about this earlier that it is so liberating. So somebody said, well, what do you do for self-care? Writing is really, I said, no, that is the self-care. That's the self-care, the writing, the ability to sit down and, you know, pursue the truth as you see it. You know, and you know, write it out, write it out. So no, I am, um, I, I, I am shocked by the reception that that book has gotten. It is certainly not the reception I expected. Um, it is certainly not, and that has problems in and of itself. Um, it always presented problems in and of itself. But um, no, that that that's that's pretty much me right there. Thank you. Good answer. Hi, my name is Anamika. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. And I want to thank you for writing this book. It's completely changed my perspective of how to think about policy making. And I kind of wanted to bring us there to, to your text, um, because I have a question about the future of this country because of what you wrote. So you wrote, there's nothing uniquely evil in these destroyers or even in this moment. They're merely men enforcing the whims of our country, correctly interpreting its heritage and legacy. And then you end that really powerful paragraph um, to talk about how you must always remember the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the regressions, all land with great violence upon the body. And this really stuck with me because last year we learned about regressions. We learned about economics. We learned about how to make policy. And nothing's really changed over the course of 100 years. What is it going to take to change the system? Well, I'm, I'm hesitant to say nothing's changed. A um, hundred years ago, we were lynching quite a few people in the South. You know, I, I, th I think that's important. Like, I think one can have a critique of the system, you know what I mean, and still, you know, admit that you know some some things. In other words, I don't think it takes anything away to say that that you know that there has been change. You know, um, but I think white supremacy is wrong. You understand? Like, I think it's deeply, deeply, deeply wrong. And so, doing less of it is still incredibly wrong. 
and still something should be, like, to be outraged about, right? And you can admit that there's less of it. You can say that. I, I have no problem saying that. I don't, you know, um, think that, you know, like, this is the same as, you know, being enslaved in South Carolina in 1840. I don't think that. I, I would never make that argument. I think it's good that, you know, although I'm about to make the case against myself, um, I think it's good that in many places, many more places, we can vote, even as that's being rolled back in certain other places. You know, I, I think what I argue against is the notion of inevitable progress. Do you, you, you see what I'm saying? Like, I think like that, that's the difference, you know, um, that it's somehow destined to be, that it will be. You know, it, you know, it's not possible to go backwards. That, that's more of my problem. In terms of what it will take, I mean, in my mind, and again, you know, being very, very aware of what I've heard here from, from our comments, which I'm going to go home and think about, actually. Um, I'm going to leave here thinking about, well, home's a long way away, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be on the plane to my next place thinking about this. Because I do think it's important to think across dimensions, right, and I work on a, on a particular dimension. Um, but from that perspective, I think it requires a critical mass of people in this country to, you know, g give up a, a real interest. You know, I, it's important to say that, I'm, I'm reading this book on French Revolution, and, it, you know, it was talking about um, who patrolled the borders between the peasants and the aristocrats, and it was talking about how the poor aristocrats, more than anyone, were most concerned about the borders because the identity of aristocracy was all they had. You see, it was really, really important. That was what distinguished them, those rituals, you know, et cetera, and I, I could not help make the leap, you know, to here and to think of, and this is speculative right now, I'm still working through this, but to think of whiteness almost as an aristocracy. Do you, you know what I mean? A, a system of rights. You understand that if you're born in a certain way, it is less likely that, again, to go back to this, someone will flip your kid over, you know, in a school and drag her across. It's just less likely. It's less likely that you'll face the kind of, you know, violence that I, you know, talk about in the book, you won't live in certain neighborhoods. Your job prospects will be different. You know, all of these sort, sort, sort of issues, you know, come to you just, you know, on the basis, you know, of, of whiteness. It, it would require folks saying, okay, we'll give that up. We'll, gi we'll give that up, yeah. you know? I, I think that, that, that it Yeah, I would just like to weigh in on this. You know, the question is, how do we arouse consciousness and our conscience about the problems we're talking about. Let's focus, for example, on race and poverty. Uh, we could just talk about race, but I just, just mentioned here race and poverty. Now, you talk about reparations as one way to address it. I talk about the redistribution of resources. Now, we both have no illusions <laughs> that either will be done uh, right. in this political climate. In the, yes, exactly. Right, precisely. Exactly. Now, exactly. the question is, uh, should we be pessimistic? Should we wallow in pessimism, saying mm -hmm. nothing can be done? Or should we hope that eventually we will have the right political climate to start to address some of these, uh, some of these issues? And that's why we should begin talking about what ought to be done. We just shouldn't say, well, we don't have the, the right political climate. We should say, what ought to be done to really comprehensive, comprehensively address the problems we're talking about? Um, I know for the three of you, uh, none of you take the political climate as given. No. And uh, in in, in all your work, um, I, I read all of your work as efforts to, to change that climate. Um, I wonder if each of you could just take 30 seconds to say something about that in your own work. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we change the climate uh, that allows uh, different policies uh, to be imagined, implemented? talk a little bit about family policy. Uh, it is, uh, I wrote a book, um, you blogged a little bit about it, uh, called, with Tim Nelson called Doing the Best I Can, about an eight year study of uh, non-custodial fathers in the Philadelphia Camden area, uh, black, white, and Latina, but the, the degree to which these men have just been erased 
these are unmarried men. Uh, they're erased by child support policy. Uh, mothers are given uh, a presumed custody over children. Fathers are put in a debtor, debtor's prison of child support with no corresponding rights to their children to make decisions over their children. Uh, uh, when, you, when you talk to audiences about uh, you know, father's right to parenting time, the first thing you'll hear is that uh, these men are violent and we have to be careful about them. Uh, you know, being, playing a part of their children's lives just to reinforce your, your point about how, how you know, the, um, these stereotypes about black men are now sort of spreading to, to, to poor men and to, and to men who have children outside of a, of a marital tie. And, and what I've been advocating for is that uh, poor men, men who have children outside of a marital tie, should be treated the same way that middle class men are. Middle class men actually get divorces and so uh, their parenting time is adjudicated. And it's absolutely amazing to me how we've encoded all of these prejudices into, into our child support policy and how much resistance there is to treating these men with, with basic human respect. So many of the things you wrote about and, and, and maybe especially the, the assumption of criminality have really become encoded into family policy in a, mm. in a way that does far more harm than a mere lack of a marital tie, right? It really drives a wedge between a father and his child. I think, I think that's so important. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, maybe there's an academic discipline that, that covers this, but I, I don't know how you measure the impact of repeatedly labeling someone a certain thing uh, over time and what that does to the political imagination. But I, I suspect it has some effect. Um, and so, like for my generation, you know, I was coming up during this this period, you know, when folks label you as, you know, super predator, when people use terms like that. Um, I'm not going to say it's responsible, you know, for you know our carceral policy, but it, it at least has some effects. It's at least within a tradition of talking about people a certain way and then going ahead and, and doing certain things to them. I, I think about my work, you know, and I, I was saying this because we were talking about the subsidy. Like I think about my work as not like, so here is like the realm as, as they saw, you know, politics is the art of the possible, right? So here's what's possible, right? Um, I feel like as a writer, I have an obligation not to be bound by that, to not write as though I were a Senate aide. That, that's, I mean, a Senate aide is a, you know, it's a very good thing to aspire to do. I'm not, I have no problem with Senate aides, <laughs> but I'm not one. <laughs> I'm not one. And so if the answer's here, you know, hey, I'll, I'll say the answer's here. But if it's way over here, and I have a responsibility to say that, to as, you know, assemble as much scholarship, as much journalism, as much evidence as I can behind it and say that, and the hope of what happens he said, over the long term, and you know, this is generational, I think. I don't think this is like my lifetime, but over the long term, maybe things open up a little bit more. You know, um, I, I was thinking, you know, we were talking about that, and you know, I think it's always worth remembering, you know, 1859, Frederick Douglass, abolitionist, is saying, right thing to do is right now free all the four million enslaved black people in the South. And no one thought that that would happen. Everyone thought that was crazy, you know? Six years later, proved to be right. Diva was talking about how in 2004, Bush is running, <laughs> running an anti-marriage equality platform. That's helping him get elected. And look where we are now. Now, that doesn't mean that I expect the you know, same thing to happen for reference, but you don't know. You don't know. And so I think, like, as, as Bill was saying, like, like the, the notion that you should only say you know, things that are within here as opposed to where we are to be, I just think is really, really important. Should I just respond? Yeah. I concur. <laughs> uh, but I just want to say, uh, Bruce, I'm glad you asked that question because I would like to say that, you know, Bruce and, and I and Rob and Matt and Mario and Diva are involved in a very comprehensive research project. We're launching it on race and poverty through Henry Louis Gates' uh, center, the Hutchins Center here at Harvard. And we not only hope that we can come up with comprehensive findings, new findings that would enhance our understanding of race and poverty, but we're establishing connections, when I won't mention any names, but we're establishing connection with some powerful institutions 
and organizations in this country that will help us translate our findings and reach a broader audience, including policymakers. And I'm very excited about that. I think that's the definition of a teaser, right? That is. <laughs> um, we have time for one last question uh, from the floor. Hi, uh, my name is Alan. I'm a senior at the college. Um, I write for the Harvard Crimson. Uh, I was just really interested in your opinion as a journalist, as an author. Uh, a lot of the discussions that we've been having about race recently have been sort of I don't want to say sidetracked, but they've been tied to discussions about free speech and free press. And I think some of your colleagues at The Atlantic have argued both sides, saying that it is a good thing, it's a distraction. I was wondering what your thought was on that. Can you be like specific? Are you asking me about trigger? Like this, I just want you to, because free speech is such a, a big thing. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, this relates to the Yale issue. I think it relates to an issue that happened at Wesleyan and a lot of other college campuses where I think people have said certain things that have been deemed offensive and have been tried to be held accountable for. I think it goes to the Christakis email. But there's a rising discussion about not the content of the speech, but should this person have been allowed to say that uh, period? And I think um, opponents have said, well, that ignores the whole issue of systemic race racism and marginalization of colored people's voices. So I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Um, being um, a journalist. Uh, yeah, journalist. no. Again, you know, um, I'm, I'm not as up on this as I should, but I, I, I do think I have some context. For this. I think, again, like we are accounting for things, like it's, you know, like you know what I, I okay, so you're, you're saying, you know, I want to dress in blackface. Why is this not my free speech issue for Halloween Fest? You know, why are you so, you know, tender and, and, and offended by this, right? Um, but again, I think like in these cases, like we're like five questions too late. You know, by the time that has become important, something else has really, really gone wrong. And so much, I don't know why it's this way. I mean, I guess this is just what we have, you know? Um, but see, like you have to back that up. So, okay, so why does blackface offend you? You know what I mean? Well, you know, it's used to degrade black folks and make them feel a certain way. Well, for what purpose? Because X, Y, and Z happened. But if we, you know, lived in a society in which white supremacy actually did not, you know, exist as a functional force, if we did not actually have that in our lives, maybe we would not care. Do you know what I mean? Like all of that context is sort of gone and you end up arguing in this really, really, really confined uh, space. I um, obviously support free speech. You know, um, <laughs> I think free speech is a good thing. I don't, I'm not, and this is just individual, right? This is not a statement on like other folks. I, I think this is like a product of me growing up where I grew up and then going to Howard. I, boy, this is horrible. I, I don't particularly get, you know, like upset about, you know, students wearing blackface and that, that sort of thing. I don't, I certainly don't support it, but it's like, listen, among certain, I'm just gonna be really honest with you, among certain populations, you know, within the African American community. And I'll just say, you know, for myself, and I'm not coming out and saying this because I think, you know, I'm in the midst of evolution on this myself. You just have low expectations for white people. <laughs> I mean, that's, there's no other way to say that. You, you really do, and so it's like, no, because it's, I mean, y'all are laughing, but it's really not funny because nobody wants to be that way. And nobody should be that way. And I don't even, I mean, it's actually been an education I've had on this book. You know, as I've gone out and torn talked off, I don't even know that it's like a correct, but it's almost like a way of shielding yourself. And you say, well, that's who they are anyway. What'd you expect? You know? Um, and so, see, the kids that go to Yale and protest that, they have expectations. And in that sense, they're kind of right. Do you understand? They actually are kind of right in some sort of, you know, profound way. Whereas me, you know, I probably would just, you know, walk past, listen, I'll be out of here in four years. I don't care about this institution anymore. <laughs> like, that would be my mindset, but that's not correct. Do you understand? Yeah. That's not correct because you should have the right to belong to the institution just like anybody else. You should feel just as at home in the institution as anybody else, you know? So that's a long rambling answer. Like I said, I haven't had the chance to digest it like I should to give you, you know, a more coherent, you know, intelligent answer. Thank you. Free. <laughs> That's my own professor from Howard. What's that? He's my own Howard University ah, professor. Ah, ah. Brilliant. Brilliant.
This is my, uh, um, <laughs> so, I didn't know you were going to be here. This is my professor, Linda Haywood. I had her at Howard University for history. She is, um, <laughs> more, than, more than any other professor I had, I had, I had Dr. Haywood for Black Diaspora One, Black Diaspora Two, and Central Africa, where she broke my heart. I mean, she really, because I came in as a, you know, a fairly fervent black nationalist Afrocentrist, and she just wasn't having it. You know, I mean, everything was, she used to say, you know, you bring your evidence and I'll bring mine. Where's your journal article? Because I got like five of them right here. You know, and um, she taught me how to think, you know, so that's why she's yelling from the floor. <laughs> So, uh, very sadly, we're over time, and uh, uh, we have to bring this uh, conversation uh, to a close. Uh, I, I thought this was a, a, a brilliant panel. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Tanahasi, for uh, sharing your time uh, with us and engaging in this conversation. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Bill Wilson and Kathy Eden uh, for their wisdom. Uh, thank you all very much.